Welcome to the Riverside Project podcast. We are mobilizing Houston to empower families and transform generations. We hope these conversations will give you a greater understanding of the issues facing our community and inspire you to find your place along the river. Today we have Nanette Lynch and Clint Wiley with Kingwood Methodist Church. We've been working alongside Kingwood Methodist for a number of years now, and we have watched them um, work humbly, sacrificially, and consistently serving kids in foster care um, and families. And so we're really grateful to have them um, on the podcast today to share a little bit about their story. So thanks for being with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Clint, can you just start off by introducing Kingwood Methodist? What yeah. is your church like? Um, what do you do as a pastor there? Absolutely. Um, so I've been been at Kingwood Methodist for about 11 years now. Um, my first first nine years of that were uh, as a youth pastor. Okay. And then transitioned into the, the missions pastor, which is, has been a, uh, an incredible joy because the heartbeat of our church is missions. Mm-hmm. Um, we've always been a church that, that is um, more out, outward facing than, than internal mm-hmm. uh, development. And so uh, it's, been, it's been fun to be able to shepherd um, that side of, of ministry yeah. at Kingwood Methodist. This industry, that kind of the, the foster care um, industry has been, I, I'd say, really kind of the leading edge over the last few mm-hmm. years. I always say that my my number one job is to to say yes, um, yeah, and it's the it's the best job, mm-hmm. um, and to walk alongside people who have a passion for something, and to say, okay, how can we walk alongside you, and um, and use the the connections, the relationships, the the different ministries even within the church to um, to help help undergird your your ministry yeah. and your passion. So, That's great. Yeah. So how did that get started? Back in, in 2014, you said, um, you know, you started figuring out what it could look like to serve in the foster care space. How did that start exactly? Uh, it was August 2014, and a young boy, sixth grader, has, was walking home from the local middle school, which is very close to our church. And one of the pastors that, were, um, that was in charge of the confirmation for sixth graders happened to be in the parking lot. And she saw him walk up, and she said, hey, what's up? said, I am so hot. Can I come in and get a drink of water? Mind so you, she, it's August. Right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, he's August walking, in Houston, Texas. Yeah. Uh, and he's walking about half a mile to a mile from his school mm-hmm. on his way home. And um, so she invited him upstairs for our youth events on Wednesday night. We have Bible studies and um, pizza, games, whatever. And he came up and just engaged with the kids upstairs. And my youngest daughter at the time was an associate um, youth pastor under Clint. And, uh, so she drove him home and said, Hey, if you want to come back on Sundays or you're welcome Sundays, mm-hmm. nine 30 Wednesday afternoon, please come by. Yeah. So that next Sunday, he and his four, three other siblings, there were two boys, two girls. They walked to church that Sunday morning and just by uh, themselves, just by themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think they rarely missed for two years. Mm. So they became very involved and entrenched in our church family. A lot of support. They needed a lot of support from the pastoral staff and my family. They became very involved with my, uh, both my girls and, um, they had a lot of needs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't the intention, right. To to start up a ministry or, or even necessarily a, uh, we didn't even know that that was a really a need. Mm-hmm. Um, in our area, yeah, um, Kingwood is not necessarily the area of town no, that you, you think. You There's don't a whole think lot of need here. That yeah. this is the kind of a prime area for this, and so it really started with just, hey, there's these these kids that uh, experienced something at this place that they said, I I want more of that, mm-hmm. whatever kept, that is. Kept I want, coming back. I want more of that. And so they just kept they kept yeah. showing up, um, and. Uh, it was we really felt like it was our duty and uh and our our joy to to just love them yeah. um and we started to hear more and more of their story and piece by piece and we i remember we we would meet afterwards and she'd be like okay you heard this you heard this you know over here Piecing we're, it all we're together. trying to piecemeal this story 
together. And all the while, just, I mean, starting to become kind of heartbroken and started, I think, I think the Lord was doing, um, a work just, just stirring our hearts, Mm -hmm. um, for, for the things that he cared about, um, in that season. It's a great way to put it very much. You mentioned them showing up. Mm. Often we talk about we're asking churches to show up for, yeah. you know, vulnerable families or families in crisis. And it's uh, I think it's interesting to, to hear the other side of it. They kept yeah. coming back yeah. and then mm-hmm. we keep coming up, like showing up for them. And then you see this restoration mm-hmm. and redemption happening mm-hmm. as those te- those two mm-hmm. things. The trust is going back and forth. That's amazing. So how did it develop over time after that? What what? kind of evolved to where you all are and how you're serving the community now. They were placed at Methodist Children's Home for about eight to nine months. And so once they left to go there, we would still go, of course, and visit them in Waco. And we have maintained contact with them all through Mm -hmm. still as of this week. uh, Two of them have been at my house. (laughs) That's incredible. Uh, That's another story. (laughs) (laughs) But once they left, I found myself... um, with a lot of time on my hands because I had invested about two and a half years in their life in a very intense way, mm-hmm. as well as my other church family had also been involved in their life. And I just started thinking I needed to find something else to do. So I became, I then heard about CASA, Child Advocates of Houston, and I immediately, it was probably two weeks after they left, I signed up for a, an information class. Within the child advocacy world i learned how the needs of foster care was were great in the mm-hmm. harris county region yeah so i reached out to stacy who was the pastor that welcomed our mm-hmm. friend into the church i said we got to do something you know what mm-hmm. we got to step up our church we didn't have a foster care ministry i didn't even know one needed yeah. to be had and so that kind of started the oasis the, the launch of Oasis with a lot of learning, webcast. Mm-hmm. Jason Johnson was a, I had our friend Jason Johnson mm-hmm. came out and w- spoke. So that launched that yeah. effort. It's so interesting sometimes to see, um, we work with churches all over the city of Houston, some who have are kind of in that spot right now. They're mm-hmm. saying, you know, after Roe v. Wade was overturned, maybe it was, you know, they just met, you know, there's always a catalyst. There's mm-hmm. some reason why um, all of a sudden, your eyes are open to the needs around you and you're thinking we have to do something, Mm -hmm. but we have no idea what to do. And what we've seen often is it, it really has to do with just increasing our proximity. Just, we get a little bit closer you get a little bit closer and then it tends to be the case that you see more and more needs. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're developing and discipling kind of our people and shepherding them to and modeling for them. We are this type of church Mm -hmm. that rather than moving away from what is broken in the world, we're actually going to be the type of people that move toward. Um, As uncomfortable and messy as that can be, I assume uh, your journey over the last several years in this has not been always (laughs) lovely. Um, It's it's riddled with mess because that's people, you know. What is that... What does that look like over time? So, well, let's go back a little bit. So you became a CASA advocate, started the Oasis ministry. Which? What did that start off looking like? And had then a, how donation did that, a donation closet. A donation closet. Uh, Jason Johnson said, don't start off recruiting foster for foster yeah. parents. Start, <laughs> Wise words. Starts small. I think another thing that that did is that, Increase the awareness within our church. Mm-hmm. 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 Increase the the buy in, yeah, from our congregation, because they they saw yep. a need, and then they they were able to meet that need mm-hmm. in some mm-hmm. small tangible way by bringing a a bag of diapers mm-hmm. or yeah mm-hmm. um, or donating a donating uh, some clothes or you know something like that 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 our congregation started to see okay maybe this is a need and and. There's some things that we can do. I know that you guys got connected to a boys home yes, or a, a, a group home or an RTC mm-hmm. as we've had on the mm-hmm. um, on the podcast mm-hmm. before. How did that happen? Well, before the the pandemic, it was in 2019. Okay, my ministry partner that has helped w- that we met in uh, about 2019. Yeah, it was the the Christmas of 2019. Mm-hmm. Her church in the Tuscaloosa area. Um, 
was drawn into this RTC um, in North Houston, mm-hmm. uh, needing they needed gifts for Christmas. So her church covered the whole um, mm. 30, there's like 35 kids there. And then we met after that. So yeah, we got plugged in at this RTC and a, that a was a point. Tur- turning point that for turning us, point. definitely. How and so? How did it, how well, did it shift? Well, just the lot, what you see and hear of uh, those boys' experiences. Um, you're getting to have a really close relationship with them and mm-hmm. they bond immediately almost with you. And yeah. um, when you see them in that situation, you think, this isn't summer camp. Mm-hmm. These kids are in dorms. They're living a This very, is their life. This mm-hmm. is their life. So that was a year's worth of very intense involvement down there and uh, proximity. You yep. know, and I heard a quote once that uh, hope is found near the ground in close proximity to the struggle. Yeah. And that is was just so revolutionary to mm-hmm. me because, yeah, you go and you hear their stories and you never got used to them asking for you to adopt them mm-hmm. and for you mm-hmm. to foster them. And, um, you know, I would say I, I'm, I can't, I'm not a foster parent. I can't foster you, but I'm going to be your best friend as long as you're here. I'm going to be your advocate and your best friend. So I would go down minimum of probably twice a week and just did, we just got, extremely involved with their school situations and um, we had tutors and mentors program mm-hmm. started one of the things that we talked about with churches um, kind of in the early when we start training churches and equipping them to find a place to get involved we really start off with like what's your why mm-hmm. what's the why that we're communicating we can't even communicate that to our people until we know mm-hmm. what our why is for mm-hmm. this and I'm sure it kind of there's a route, but it, it shifts a little bit over time because you see mm-hmm. more. But what would you say is your why to keep going? I mean, a lot of I feel like a lot of churches would be like, whew, I think we've gone too far and really pull back. Or some of the situations you've told me about, you're like, I feel like a lot of churches would just shut their doors and say, we cannot keep for liability purposes or whatever. Like we're this is too risky. This mm-hmm. is too difficult. Um, but you've kept going. What's the why behind continuing because to these move kids forward? deserve someone to care about them in mm-hmm. a very deep way mm-hmm. and they all know at some point i hope they know that we did we do and we did care for them yeah very deeply and you know the lord calls us to to love these kids they're there in foster care not because of anything they've done mm-hmm. Every adult in their life has let them down. And so we're not going to let them down. We, we commit to something. We're going to follow through. From a church standpoint, mm-hmm. you asked the why. And, um, you know, there were definitely a lot of those conversations behind closed doors. They have to. to say, wise to have those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is liability uh, playing a part in here? Is this is this putting our church kind of out on a limb? Is, is um, we had conversations with our our insurance, you know, agency at the, at the church. And, mm-hmm. um, and it all, it all kept coming back to God keeps opening doors. Yeah. And, and we, we have to step through them. Um, if he's, if he's putting that in front of us and giving us this opportunity, um, then we, we'll figure out the, the logistics, but, um, the, the why is because, because God said, said so. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's incredible. And so I think it's huge that that we get get the opportunity to say yes um, to those calls. One thing that I remember this conversation vividly because over uh, I don't exactly remember the time frame, but I remember talking to you and to Marla um, and you're saying, hey, the, the boys home we've been caring for is being shut down. Mm. And you walked through that. We spent a couple of very hard days together trying to figure out how to get these kids stable. We fought for them. You mm-hmm. guys fought for them. Um, how do we keep them in a place where they they feel safe, right, in the midst of all of this upheaval? Um, and then over a couple of months, you guys kept saying, now that the, the boys' home is gone, we still feel like the Lord is leading us to keep to keep serving this specific group of kids, these really, really hard 
mm-hmm. situations. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were kind of talking about it at the same time that the children without placement kind of crisis was at its peak. Mm-hmm. And we've been talking about that and what was going on with it and asking churches to step in and provide meals and things like that. And I remember you guys coming to me and saying, I think we, we want to be a, a, a CWAP kind of children without placement shelter. What do you think about that? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Yes, we need that. I know that we need that. But I was kind of a little bit fearful and hesitant because I didn't want to put you in a situation. I want to make sure you had all the facts, you know, that you knew what you were stepping into. Um, Because we've seen other, you know, churches Mm -hmm. do that and it has not gone well. Like, you know, we know enough about those types of situations that they can be very, very difficult. I didn't want to put you in that. And you guys were so persistent. You know, you kept saying, you kept coming back saying, I, no, I really, we have this apartment that is, that we own that's across the street and we want to renovate it a little bit and get it ready. And we want it to be a safe place for these kids and their caseworkers. And I said, okay, let's, I'm going to put you in touch with the people that you need to talk to and let's go for it. And it has been, I hear from so many people from attorneys to mm-hmm. caseworkers to leadership at CPS, um, that it has it has been such a, a place of stability and hope for all of them because it, it is it, it's not even just the place, it's the people, right? It's mm-hmm. you showing up with Sonic, you having a chore chart, you providing structure and the, your volunteers and the other people involved mm-hmm. and the relationships that they can access through this kind of shelter situation. Mm-hmm. Walk me through kind of on your side. I, that's my perspective of it was these people, like I, I'm so scared to, to have you step into something that's going to be so very difficult. But what, what kept pushing you guys down that road and what, how have you processed that whole thing? Because you're still doing it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's yeah. we're still up in. We're yeah. still We've, had We've had 36 kids. kids. Yep. Mostly boys. We, at different times, right? You can oh, have yeah, four, yeah. Oh, yeah. four up to no, four at a time. No, 30 yeah. kids at a time. Yeah, yeah. let's specify. No, that. we don't. Uh, we only take two at a time. Okay. We used to, could take, we could, we had four beds, but now we we got rid of the bunk beds. So okay. we're just down, down to two beds. Okay. Twice we had three boys there and it was a disaster. Yeah. Um, so we, we felt like two teenage boys in that space with, all the workers that are rotating through there all day long to watch them 24 mm-hmm. seven, that dynamic of two work the best. Yeah. I don't think we would have said yes to that call if it hadn't been for the, the slow development of this mm-hmm. ministry mm-hmm. and passion within yeah. our church. Most churches don't start there. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, that's not, not necessarily an entry place. Yeah. We're dealing with some of the, the kids that have the most trauma. Yeah. Um, they're the the kids that are hard to place, um, yep. which is why they're in this designation within the system. And yeah. so mm-hmm. what we've seen is that these kids that step into a stable environment are not the, not the kids that their chart says that they mm-hmm. are. Yeah. Um, I think they're, they're defined by most of their lives by what's written on this this piece of paper Mm -hmm. and everybody who comes in contact with that case file has an instant impression about that kid and it changes the lens in which they view that kid. It changes the, the way that they respond when some little thing happens. Um, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, they, they solidify that, that image if, Mm -hmm. if they talk back once or, you know, Mm -hmm. and so I think one of the things that Nanette's been really good about through this process is to say, you get a clean slate when you Mm -hmm. step in here and, and I'm going to love you, um, no matter what. And you're not the, you're not the kid on your chart. Um, and you get a chance to prove that. Yes. I tell them that church there's many people that pray for you daily and they love you and they're letting you live here. Don't tear my stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear. Let's be clear. <laughs> Don't put a hole in the wall. So we've only had like three incidences of pretty rough stuff, but for the most part, you know, they're older boys, mm-hmm. um, very hard mental health diagnosis. And, um, but many 
many tell me, I'm here because I don't have a place to go. And I'm here because no one wants me. Mm. And that is hard to hear. Mm. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And they also tell me quite frequently, because again, our church has said yes, which also includes the youth department, our our youth pastor and our uh, youth associate, two sweet girl, women, young women, have wrapped around those kids any the ones that are safe to go and that have behaviors safe enough that they can go to the to our church activities they're of course supervised by the 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 worker that's watching them for that Mm -hmm. period of time they have been welcomed tremendously and they love love going over there and they will come back and they have told me many times i felt normal for for the first time in many years yeah. Again, like uh, just just a, a really f- kind of cool moment. Um, we had a, a boy that was was there, and um, they were having a, a karaoke night mm-hmm. at the at the church. It was like a Halloween karaoke thing. So he he comes up, and you know he's he's taller than every other kid, and uh, stands out a little bit. And by the end of the night, he's like leading the song the song up front. And he has 10 middle school kids behind him, like <laughs> cheering him on, like, like singing yeah. the song with him. And, and he's, he's, he's a rock star for a yeah. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was his first Sunday yeah. there. That was the first time that he'd ever been introduced to, mm-hmm. to these. And so we had him kids. five weeks and we laughed by saying, dude, you think are, you're a member now because all yeah. the pastors knew him. Yeah. Many In of the weeks, li- the amount yes. of Im- the impression. Yes. Mm-hmm. So our church is just phenomenal with the support and love for these kids and i mean they they bought in always yeah even though you know some sunday mornings there are policemen there and um you know we've had issues that the cops are there in the parking lot and they just pull in and just walk across the street go to church something's going on at the shelter I'm like, <laughs> yep, sorry about that bert <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that bert <laughs> You mentioned that somebody recently was like, why would you do that? Aren't you scared? Like, do you not count the risk? Do you not count that as? I've kind of processed that. Um, And, and there's some, there's some within the church, you know, that that may be a little bit anxious about this and that we would, that we would have those kids there, you know, um, I think those kids yeah, is the right. part mm-hmm. of the problem. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And um I think some of the the other things the missional uh, character of the church has played into kind of an understanding. Uh there's a lot of like prison ministry that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, culture. And and so there's a culture that yeah. that kind of says you know these these people have done something or um their life is and has been this way. But that's not the sum of who they are. Yeah. And so I, I think there's, I think that's given space yes. to trust the leadership to say yes yeah. in some of those places. And so many of our volunteers, you know, were mentors and tutors. I mean, so many, so many of our congregation were mentors and tutors at uh, the boys' facility that we were involved in. And we took them on outings all the time, talk major things like the zoo, the Astros game. And mm-hmm. I mean, there was never issues. Yeah. I mean, so the Seawap shelter, we're just gleaning on our our history with mm-hmm. of what I mean, I have a pretty good gut feeling about a kid and I know I three times I've seen the the switch and then you know i've called um the leadership at dfps has been amazing mm-hmm. and when i call they return my call and they fix the problem yeah so i could say we're fixing to lose this kid i can tell today it's not going to be good and they will they know and they, they know and they'll move them before um we've had like i said a couple of incidences where it did not end well yeah but for the most part um i don't I really don't ever worry about the risk Mm -hmm. involved to my personal safety Mm -hmm. or to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't, to be clear, I don't ask because I think you should be concerned about the risk. I I ask because that's what I hear. Um, Not, not maybe explicitly, Mm -hmm. but I think a lot of times our 
both in the church and just personally. I mean, mm-hmm. when we talk about taking a kid into our home or getting involved with a biological family or mentoring for a kid in an RTC, the, there's a lot of fear involved in that. And there's yeah. a lot of temptation and understandable temptation to kind of want to isolate and mm-hmm. insulate because uh, mm-hmm. it's what it is comfortable. And when I open myself up to that, there's trauma, mm-hmm. there's so much outside of our control. Absolutely. There's a whole world out there that can be really scary. And so what I often hear is we can't, we couldn't do that, you know, and it's been really wonderful to hear from you just, and to see how much over time the Lord has increased your capacity to handle hard things. Mm-hmm. Um, we talk about that some with church leader training and, and mm-hmm. working with stakeholders that it's not that the hard doesn't get it's not that it gets easier. It's just that our capacity to carry mm-hmm. it with another mm-hmm. person can grow over time. And that's kind of what you're you're showing today is you started off with just doing some diapers and, and a family yeah. that needed you and you said yes. And then the Lord asked you to do more and you said yes. And over time, he's kind of developing you as a church um, and solidifying your ministry as really, really... Um, making a dent, you know, you're really, really, um, seeing a lot of fruit from that obedience. So Mm -hmm. I see that. Another fruit I see is the relationships with the workers that come. Yeah. I love them so much because when we first, I mean, we knew what CWAP was and we kind of, Merle and I would game plan has, has a day in the life of a CWAP kid going to look like, well, that was uh, an eye opener. That was an eye opener because yeah. we really had you no just kind of predi- we're we predicting like, what is this going to look yeah. like, yeah. Mm-hmm. and we're like you know getting the meals it was the meals brought in and all the things we got a we have a Y membership they can go to the Y, uh, they've been enrolled in our school several have gone to the high school or the middle school, and some the, graduated yeah yeah we had one wow. yeah, and the humble ISD counselors they're fantastic. they're fantastic they come to the shelter sit with the child if possible, bring them meals. So there's a lot of community involvement, Mm -hmm. but they rotate three at a time, four at a time workers 24 seven. So on just a regular day, these kids see 15 to 16 faces a day, new faces a day. So that was very disorienting to me because when I'd go in, I started to try to learn their names. Well, it became a joke (laughs) after about, (laughs) 50 people. And you're pretty good with names. Yeah. Well, I, you do. So, yeah. so within about a month and a half, probably, I had met over 200 people, 150, because I used to write their names down and try to remember a little, you know, like who, something mm-hmm. to help me recall their face. But our goal was to make this the best, most safest, loving environment so these workers will sign up to come back. So the consistency mm-hmm. would continue to start to build and then it, it, it did end up that way pretty quick the shifts get filled really quick i know about 50 of them on uh you know first side I, I can tell you yeah. who they are and what a they, great way to, to and bless they them. love coming there and i love hanging out with them i'll go up i go twice a day and just hang out and they're yeah. like my friends are in my phone and so that has been a huge That's blessing amazing. last question would be So two, you know, if there's other churches in our community who are asking the question, like, we want to get involved. We know nothing about Mm -hmm. foster care. We know nothing about how to serve along the river, but we're feeling like we need to do something. What would you say to them Um, just in terms of maybe where to start, but also what what should they be thinking through? What could they glean from your wisdom over the last couple of years? Well, like you said, don't be scared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared. Be brave. Because I have people calling me from other churches, you know, like maybe wanting to do a parent night out. What does that look like? Mm-hmm. And they're nervous. I'm like, it's not a big deal. Just have an event. Everybody get together and just love these children for two hours and let the parents go have a meal yeah. in the quiet. So don't be fearful. So don't be fearful and call Amber Knoll. <laughs> <Good. laughs> right. The Riverside Project <laughs> is amazing and your resources are wonderful. And it's our hope to really it. just replicate, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, when you said people call you to talk about doing a parent night out, I'm sending them to you, okay. you know, we're kind of Thank sending you. different <laughs> people or, yeah. you know, we're saying there's a yeah. church that pops up and says, I think we want to, based on if we give them the resources 
to understand their community better. Let's not meet all the needs that we think exist Mm -hmm. in the community. Let's find out what the needs actually are in your community based on where your church Mm -hmm. is. And then we can say, here's some ideas. And then if they say, yeah, there's a lot of foster families in our area. There's not a parent night out. Let's start there. Mm-hmm. That could be a great way. We have a good mm-hmm. kid, you know, children's space. <clears throat> and then it's shift over to, to Nanette. Yeah. She's done yeah. this before. I can't speak to the ins and outs of running that every day, the practicals, mm-hmm. but I know who people who can, and I'm going to make that connection. Um, and I have heard, actually, I know another church in Tomball replicated mm-hmm. what y'all did, mm-hmm. and I had a friend who sent their kids to that mm-hmm. parent night out, and she texted me and said, do, do you partner with this church? Because they did this parent night out, and it was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking, way to go to that church, but also I know where they learned that, and they learned it from you. Um, and so that is what our vision is this ecosystem where, yes, there's we want to be an organization that helps to make those connections and equips our churches and helps yeah, them understand absolutely. the community. Like We need all that. But it's more so not just really us. It's everyone working together and not being afraid to be like, we're going to call the other church in a totally different denomination that may believe things that are different. Yes. All that's out the window when it comes for, yeah. to caring for the vulnerable. You know, I'd say from a church side, if you're a church looking to kind of get involved in this, this, um, this work, begin with prayer. Yeah. Um, if you start heading in this direction and it's not where God is leading you, then it's not going to, it's not going to work yeah. because it's hard. Um, it's messy. And if it isn't for the sustaining power of, of God, that's, that's led you each step. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's, if God hasn't brought the, the people into, into your path to, to gain a passion for this. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's just check bark, check, check boxes on a, on a to-do list, then it's just not yeah. going to work. And so I'd say a first step is just begin to begin to pray that God would, God would give you the heart mm-hmm. for this work. Yeah. It's been so great to witness the fruitfulness of, after you've said yes um, and, and seeing, bringing more and more people into that vision. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for everything thank that you. you do, as hard as it is for continuing um, to be present. So we're, we're here with you always. Uh, we're here to support you. We're here thank to get you, you so what you much. need, make any connection you need. Um, but we're really grateful for the work you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. To those listening, we hope these conversations have inspired you to find your place along the river. And we welcome you to join us in bringing hope and renewal to the city of Houston. If you'd like more information on how to get involved, please visit riversideproject.org and submit a contact form. We'll see you next time.